The subject of this, uh, of this hard talk is on the increasing uh, globalization uh, of ILRI. And um, this came, of course, uh, I mostly from the recommendations of the External Program and Management Review. Uh, and I'd like to sort of go straight to Carlos, uh, first of all, on that. At one stage, I mean, when we met in the corridor, which is where we seem to have most of our discussions, uh, you were very nervous as to whether the team was coming to grips with the complexities of ILRI. Uh, but then they came out with the recommendations that the ILRI operates well and it was visionary and it was dynamic uh, and, and the results will have clearly influenced your opinion on the process. Uh, <laughs> but my question is, did they do a good job? Well, I think they did a good job and we did a good job in conveying the complexity of ILRI. I think we have discussed in the last few days that the way we operate, etc., is very different from a CIMIT or an IRI or so. And obviously, it's not that simple to convey. Did they capture that, though? Did they, were you, are you happy that they captured all those complexities in the report? Or did you feel that some of them, uh, some of the issues were dealt with rather simplistically? Well, I would imagine every report which looks at the institute across can't cover all items with the equal depth, but I think they, depth, but they picked up on the key issues, I think, and uh, did, in general, a good job. I think one also needs to keep in mind these EPMRs are different from what they were in the past, and in the past, they were very much standalone exercises, and sort of every scientist was expecting to be grilled by the panel. They have now moved into much more of a almost audit type of approach where they are basically looking not at the specifics of each of our work, but do we have the right processes in place to manage the research? Are we having the internally or center commission reviews? Are we having all these processes done? And that's why the nature is different from maybe what you had in mind about a typical C uh, EPMR from the past. Well, not me, necessarily, because you were the one that was worried uh, at yeah. one stage. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay, look, we're going to deal mainly with this, uh, the recommendation about globalization. Now, from what it, as it's coming from an EPMR recommendation that ILRI needs to get out into Asia, out into Southern Africa and into West Africa, uh, is that not rather a, a supply-led process? Uh, do they want us? Are they sitting there waiting for us to come clamoring in on the aeroplane? Carlos? I think that's a, a very valid question. I think the panel definitely has looked at our own research, which has shown where poverty and livestock intersect and has engaged with us in, in quite a bit of discussion. I think what we, as an institute, trying to work through partners, we have quite a challenge in listening to all these individual demands coming from different corners. Uh, actually, I think it was in the room next door, we had the Mozambican ambassador talking to us and saying, well, you know, the Italians gave us 700 buffaloes in Mozambique. Can you help us manage those 700 buffaloes? Yeah? <laughs> and we said, well, no, <laughs> we can't, you know. This is not a global priority. So really a challenge is in terms of understanding where all these different voices we hear aggregate. Okay, well let me go into that. So you say we showed where the, the, the poverty is and we're going to go there, uh, basically. But uh, maybe I should turn to John and say, uh, John, do we, uh, do we sh is, as a research institute, is it dealing with the basket cases, which is where our opportunity is, or should we be looking at a variety of different levels uh, of, of development to, to, to really use our expertise most? Well, I think we should always keep our eye on the poverty ball and where we can help poor people, but that is not always directly working with poor people. Uh, for example, I think it's quite interesting in some of the work that's been done on dairy in Kenya, the huge employment benefits of somebody who's a little more able and is, tr is organizing milk collection and transfer to employ lots of other people. Or somebody who owns a dairy cow who is not necessarily the poorest person, but who is employing other people as their incomes rise. So I think there are 
different opportunities and we should think strategically and, and critically about during the, on, in the value chain how poor people are involved. I'm glad you say that. I, I, our, our friend Ian Schoons uh, from uh, uh, IDS sort of hammered us for recommending that people might work on East Coast fever because you know, those people were uh, out, of, out of poverty and didn't have the problem. Uh, okay, uh, the, the, the question is do we have the right mix of people and disciplines and, and management uh, because we are managers, facilitators, brokers. Do we have the right people to move into these other regions? Surely they're full of them. It's an interesting question. I think, I mean, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think there's a real challenge in how we do this. Now, um, as I tried to describe on Monday, um, we want to set the kind of global agenda for ILRI because that's, that's really what we can help people with, I think. And then that could be quite a different nuanced approach in different regions and places where we're working um, because the kind of active engagement of kind of ILRI with its partners is the thing that's going to have impact, uh, our influence. So I, I see this looking very different in different places of the world. Okay. Carlos, how will these changes impact our programs in Eastern Africa? And what will our partners here think? Are we deserting them? <laughs> I think that's a very valid question and a communications challenge. I think what we've been trying to do is to really look at global issues, but for a lot of practical reasons, the cases have tended to cluster in Eastern Africa. And in a scenario with tough funding, this was one way in which we could get more mileage per dollar given by taxpayers to us. I think what we probably haven't done enough is really creating those global public goods, to use the famous word we heard. I'm coming back to some of those later yeah. on. Yeah. I think we're very much trying to get the East African partners to help us address these broader global issues. So will we be closing down Nairobi or Addis and moving to Delhi or uh, Maputo or Lagos? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think so. You I don't think, think so? No. That's not a very direct uh, <laughs> answer, Carlos. Well, we have strong we might. human resources, physical assets, a lot of things which are not that mobile. So I think we will certainly work from this base, but what we're trying to do is to get a much more, if you want, network approach with partners, and particularly in Asia where you've got a whole range of partners some countries with quite strong partners into a different type of relationship. I think the way we've been operating in East Africa can't be the same way we'll be operating in Asia. It will be much more building on strong partners there, getting strategic alliances to do things. Okay. And now let's move. You raise this international public goods, global public goods issue, John. Um, wh how difficult are these to achieve, given our mandate of working through and with a variety of uh, of, of national partners. I mean, how, how difficult are these to, particularly uh, when you're moving into new areas of the world where they are going to have very much uh, their own interests. Oh, we've got, okay, Ilri, Ilri, yeah, you know, we, we, come on then. And then we come on and say, oh, but we're interested in international public goods. And they've got, well, we've got this problem with the buffalo that you just mentioned. I mean, how, 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 uh, how are we going to deal with that? I think you've characterized the, the problem very well. Um, and and to, let's t we could take a couple of examples, I think. Uh, we've been talking a little bit this week about the long shadow and the importance of increasing productivity and how, what are the kinds of things in terms of feeding efficiency, et cetera, that might happen. And what would be the role of an ILRI and what would be the role of partners? Well, if you look at ILRI, I mean, one of our comparative advantages is that, that we get to see the context in a number of different places and we get to see what's happening across uh, West Africa, the rest of Africa, Asia, and how that works. Um, but we also have the opportunity to work with partners who have a large array of scientists who are working on feeding and could be working on feed efficiency. Uh, ICAR in India, for example, has a, a large group of scientists. So does Embrapa in Brazil. So does uh, ARC in South Africa. And how we tap into those to play our kind of appropriate role and then 
looking at you know how that may inform what they do and the kind of iterative relationship but you're quite right it's that'll be kind of looking at people's different interests and how we can work together. When we come to some of the specifics of those, I mean, take for example, uh, natural, we're, we're looking at poverty reduction in the context of natural resource management. Uh, is, can we deliver IPGs in this area? Isn't it, is it not more a site-specific uh, um, subject? And what about, uh, we've just been hearing about innovation systems, aren't they also very site-specific? I think they are indeed very site-specific. And, uh, and so this is part of the dilemma. How do you actually learn some things in the specific sites where it's important and where there are lessons to be learned and then what are the things that can be generalized and maybe there's only a few kind of drivers of change that can be assessed or factors of change but maybe the approaches are more generalizable in certain circumstances so that that may be one option okay well Dick Harwood uh, told me over breakfast that it all it, that, that they are indeed it all depends on the methodology so it's developing the methodology to 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 analyze these okay uh, Carlos what about vaccines and diagnostics which we've been talking about uh, for reasons of sustainability we're trying to engage we are engaging with commercial partners uh, how does their need for ownership compromise these IPGs? IPGs can sort of exist and have to be turned into actual products which farmers can use. So you always have a link with a private sector, be it seeds or so. The difference between what our crop institutes, sister institutes do and us is that in the seed business it is relatively easy if you have produced, identified certain materials, they are built into breeding programs and a number of institutes can produce those companies, etc. In our business, in the vaccines, there are economies of scale which imply that you have to think very carefully about who you give frequently non, uh, basically exclusive rights on certain things. Yes. So how you craft these exclusive rights is very critical. And there are all sorts of fancy intellectual property agreements being done, humanitarian clauses, all those sort of things which make sure that you do keep the private sector incentive to produce the good. And have we done that still, successfully? Well, for example, in the case of the work, the work with uh, ECF, yes. uh, we have very clear clauses, for example, that actually University of Edinburgh through DFID has the, the intellectual property okay. if we come up with it and they can negotiate with the companies, for example, that if they don't use this for a certain number of years, it can be allocated to somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Now, the scientific credibility, John, is critical to our increased globalization. And the external program and management review said, we, got many we have many publications relevant to regions of Africa, some even relevant to the whole of Africa, uh, but not much relevant to outside. I mean, how do we change that in three years? They're going to reassess this in three years. How do we, how do we change that? <laughs> exactly two and a half years <laughs> right it relates a little bit to the question you asked me before about in these global public goods what do we do at a kind of broad and contextual scale and then what do we really need to do on the ground I think there's a lot of mileage and we kind of discussed this last night in our interaction between management committee and, and our scientific leadership in the operating projects about the importance of synthesis and pulling things together and, and that requires some analysis as well, but also identifying some gaps. I think that would be major progress in the okay. next few years. So what we need to get, yeah. as we said last night, we need to get moving with exactly. that. Is yeah. there some scope for addressing this uh, internally? I mean, I, apart from the one that you, uh, that you mentioned, and Phil Toy spoke uh, the other day about the rigorous reviews we used to go through in, in, in ILRAD. Uh, now we seem to struggle to even have a reg regular seminar series. Uh, can we do something about that uh, on the wider engagement, not just producing these synthesis papers? Yeah, yeah I think that I, I feel that concern as well. And I think uh, Rick articulated part of it earlier this morning. And, and uh, I think this is something that we need to get right. We we've have paid attention to that in, in terms of uh, getting some external review on our research quality in terms of biometrics data and some of those basic building blocks that we need to do right and we need to move forward on that and, and that's a big challenge for the research methods group this year. I think also I'm encouraged by, by things I'm thing, seeing in the themes in terms of building up our research capacity for key issues like breeding, vaccines, markets, um, and so uh, I think we just have to move forward with those. But I agree. I mean, our, our calling card is 
that we have the capacity to do research and when we lose the trust of that, yeah. well, there's not much left. Carlos, with some nervousness, I ask you, uh, Latin America, um, uh, we, we, we've got many poor, poor people associated with Latin America, livestock is very important uh, in, in the region. Uh, what, is, what is the future role of, of Ilri? Because it's not mentioned uh, in, in, in the future in terms of your responses uh, in, to, to the EPMR on this. What is the role? I think this is a very useful question to have at this time. Um, we have, as you know, have a long-standing policy of the board that we were basically using project resources, specifically in Latin America. That the priority we have set is Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and somewhat Southeast Asia, and that in Latin America we would work based on project resources, which would be funded specifically for that, so that the scarce core would not be allocated to that region on the arguments that yes, there are poor people, there are also strong regional institutions, national institutions, Embrapa is as big as a CGAR, for example, with very powerful research machinery. There are a lot of alternative suppliers, particularly if you think about the temperate parts of Latin America, there's a lot of synergy with New Zealand, Australia, other parts of the world. So, what we have agreed is clearly to focus initially in the Andean zone and Central America, which were the poorest pockets. Yeah. So that's where we, we have been. And I think this is consistent with what the EPMR is also telling us. We are clearly having to make trade-offs in terms of where we put the very limited core. And so what we are, I think, foreseeing is that that principle of providing specific project money in cases where we can make a specific research contribution is the way to go rather than aim to have a large program of our own. So, but just this morning, if I may interrupt, yeah. well, we've, we've been dealing in the markets theme with the Central America uh, project, which is they've been trying to look at the candidate IPGs. And uh, when, when, when we were coming out, I mean, Jeff Mariner uh, said to me, uh, this is tremendous substrate for certain of the big issues of, uh, of Ilri. How do we take advantage of these opportunities with the resource constraints that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we have? How do we adequately use the, 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 our little history there? How, how do we move that forward? I think uh, we do have a certain track record and we do have good relations in the region with the regional organizations and particularly with our sister institute, SIAT. So for example, what we are now trying to encourage is that actually SIAT takes a lead role in managing activities there and that we provide specific technical inputs into those. I think that is a more sustainable symbiosis than us trying to drive programs there where we don't have a critical mass, we don't have, if you want, an obvious uh, comparative advantage in providing the institutional capacity which is there in SIAT, CATI and other places. Okay, you mentioned just now Embrapa. Uh, Embrapa is now establishing, I was surprised to hear for, uh, uh, last night, an office in Ghana uh, with two researchers there basically looking at technology transfer. Uh, are there opportunities for us to, to sort of strengthen these triangular links of uh, partner with them there so that we can keep in touch with Latin America but also strengthen our programs in, in West, West Africa? Is this Indeed, actually in my to-do list there is ah. a letter replying <laughs> to the Director for International Cooperation who actually wants Ilri to work in the Amazon. And we have said, well, there's a lot of other players and we don't have a comparative advantage there, but we believe there's a lot to do with Brazilian technology in Africa and Asia. And okay. specifically, for example, in the area of animal breeding, Brazil has been very much at the cutting edge in terms of developing tropical, tropical breeds. Breed, yeah. So okay. we think that is a more logical way to engage with Brazil. Yeah. Very, very good. John, you've raised these six big issues, and, uh, and I understand from last night they were raised for funding, not for programmatic purposes. Uh, 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 <laughs> a few people uh, entertained by that. Um, what... Uh, what um, what, are the, what implications do each of these have for these new regions that we're going into? I mean, for avian flu, it's possibly uh, obvious, but, uh, but what, are they, what implications do they have uh, in terms of regional divisions? Okay. Well, let me start by talking about the three big issues that we've been approaching in this APM. And uh, I think in, in the kind of scenario I painted before about kind of the global agenda for ILRI and then how it gets nuanced for each region, for example, in southern Africa, we see very much that 
markets are a big demand of our partners there. Uh, both the South Africans and many of the other countries are saying, how do we get poor people into these markets that are developed already? So I see that as kind of something pushing forward on the market front. But obviously, to support the, the opportunities for poor people, we'll need to get some of the intensification right and or the vulnerability and risk right, as, as you're quite aware of in the region. And I see those as kind of supportive tools to a larger market. Good, I'm glad about the vulnerability, because you didn't mention the vulnerability on, uh, on the opening day. You just talked about markets in southern Africa. But vulnerability, and we've just finished this study with, uh, for FAO, which they actually invited us to do. Uh, 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 and I think it's, it's critical with the droughts and uh, uh, etc. So, okay, sorry. Well, do you see us, for example, in, in pastoral, the, 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 the pastoral uh, big issue, do you see us starting to operate in Mongolia, in Tibet, for example? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think our, our really, in the pastoral systems, our comparative advantage on the ground is in tropical pastoral systems. Now, there are lots of other people, and, and this relates a little bit to your question about Latin America as well to Carlos. I mean, our approach in Central America, for, or in Central Asia, for example, has been to support ICARDA rather than trying to set up our own infrastructure to do that. Um, and so I very much see that there's the kind of global contextual thing and the approaches, as Dick Harwood said, that might be transferable, linking up with the partners who have comparative advantage in temperate systems working on the ground. So I see in the pastoral areas in field work much more in Africa, but also working in West Africa and Southern Africa, a little bit of work in South Asia in some of the tropical pastoral system, or in the tropical pastoral systems there, but then on the more synthetic side and the, and the broader kind of meta-analysis of what's happening overall. Okay. Um, what about avian flu? Where does avian flu fit programmatically within, within our themes? Where does it fit? Because, we're, because you know, we've taken on all this, uh, uh, this response, which we've heard so much about, fascinating, uh, but are we not, is it not little a pocket uh, all on its own? Well, you know, it's quite interesting, and we're having quite a discussion now about, for example, where our health activities fit, and, and you've been in the kind of forefront of that debate uh, over several years. Um, the, um, I, I guess there's lots of different ways that you can cut these things up. Where the, where the kind of critical mass of our work on avian influenza now is in the markets themes, because for poor people in developing countries, it's the real market shock that that's an important component of this. But we also have heard... Uh, also, with all these huge mortalities, is it not a vulnerability? The, the, Indeed. The, so we've, we've, we've also heard about it from that point of view, and there's no reason why we can't work on those issues, and part of the project that's proposed, the larger projects that are proposed on this are looking at what are the impacts of, of poor people on the ground as well. But I, I get nervous about the... It look, if we are looking at the vulnerability issues, that it's sort of looking at health... Uh, mortality in poultry in isolation. Should that not be uh, in partnership with other people looking at other aspects of vulnerability uh, of smallholder systems that, uh, that, that have poultry? I mean, how do we adequately integrate uh, that with uh, other responding to issues of vulnerability? Well, I think it relates to how we look at vulnerability in all kinds of systems, whether it's smallholder or whether it's in pastoral systems. And the people who are really working on the ground are other partners, not us. And what we're trying to do, and I think which we need to do better, is to integrate with other partners who have those responsibilities and, and come to an agreement with them on the role of research in that. And one of the big pushes that we've got now, for example, in pastoral areas, is how do we think at, have a dialogue with the kind of development partners who are really challenged to come up with an answer quite quickly to do something, and how our research can support them. Okay. Carlos, uh, what will the resource allocation of Ilri look like uh, in three to five years on these different regions? How much is it going to change? Well, I think it depends on how you account for it. Obviously, wherever you have your headquarters, there's a fixed cost of running. Um, that, I think, shouldn't be allocated to that region in a global institute. Uh, but the operations as such, I would imagine that Africa and Asia can probably in three to five years be about equal shares. We think now we're two-thirds, one-third. It could move possibly to 50-50. I hope that we could grow the pie significantly and that basically this license to operate and the way we're trying to address issues 
will allow us to engage Asian resources actually in funding quite a bit of the Asian portfolio. So we're actually with Ian visiting Tata Foundation, which has just approached us because they have heard that we're going to do more in India, for example. So we believe that Asia, particularly the rapidly growing part of Asia, has new philanthropy, new, other, new sources, because we don't think the traditional donors are the major players in a number of those areas. So growing more in Asia probably than we can in Africa right now over the coming years, putting more effort into that growth. Yeah. Well, we've been moving some of our directors into Asia, West Africa and Southern Africa, right. or possibly bringing our current regional representatives more into institutional management or some combination thereof. All is possible. I think we All had a possible. director in Washington sometime. So why not? Have you any specific plans? Uh, not yet. <laughs> when will you have them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that will have to be sorted out within three Once years. We, hopefully. Form follows function. We first have to agree exactly what we're going to do. Okay, my last, uh, my last question, and this was an issue raised uh, big time by the uh, EPMR. Uh, uh, internet connectivity, if you like, uh, in, in loose terms. If we're going to be really wanting to have this global community, we're going to be turned into a global center, what the heck? I notice that you, you make a very, a very nice statement. Uh, the recommendation agreed, you already said. It's committed to expand the capacity with increased expenditures in 2007. Ilri and ECRAF are establishing a common IC, but this is going to be involved more than Ilri and ECRAF. We're going to have to involve centers in other parts of the world. How how are you actually going to come to grips to, with this problem, Carlos? I think I'll defer to Bruce and Ian. I don't see Ian around. No, no, they're not up here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the no. buck stops with you. Okay. <laughs> well, we have just had a study, an ICER, an internally commissioned external review, which is actually looking at the infrastructure and responding to some of those questions. I think there's a number of things which we can do if we invest the resources but there's also a lot of dependency on ETC in the case of here and the Kenya, Kenya telecoms, etc. What that external review says is, and it had some, one of the staff members very knowledgeable about fiber optics developments in Eastern Africa, that I think in one or two years we should have fiber optics connecting all these places and that that would dramatically change the scene. How is that going to affect, what about Delhi and... Uh, well, and, that's and, not a problem. They're, uh, much ahead of us. And, and, and Southeast Asia and, uh, and West Africa? Uh, well, IRI has certainly got very good connections in the Philippines. Has that, was that part of the mandate for the, um, this review that's just taken place? Of no, looking this review was specifically looking in general at IRI at is, as it is at present and what are the services we're requiring, particularly the whole area of bioinformatics, uh, which has very heavy requirements which we're not being able to provide around the clock right now. Okay, so, but, so there's still some thought to be put into how it will respond to this expansion within yeah. three years. Yeah, but, but there's a whole CG-wide initiative looking at the secondary centers, not the headquarters centers, but other centers, okay. and, and how that can be improved, and Ian Moore has been a big part of that. Okay, John and Carlos, thank you very much indeed. Well done. <laughs> thank you very much.